Hey everyone, in order to make better coatings in my sputter chamber, I need to accurately control what gases are being added in real time to the chamber. So I started looking into these mass flow controllers and I thought I'd talk about what I learned. At first I thought I would be able to accurately control gas flow with a manual flow meter, also called a rotometer. And these are pretty cool because they're completely unpowered and so there's really no chance that the electronics can die and they're typically much less expensive than a true mass flow controller. So my plan was to just turn the needle valve and adjust the flow to what I needed and then call it quits. But this actually doesn't work because what these flow meters measure is the volume flow rate. And if the pressure changes, like it will if the uh, pressure regulator is not perfect or if the temperature varies a little bit, then the actual amount of gas going through the, the flow meter will change a little bit, or the reading will change, it becomes inaccurate. So what these meters are actually measuring is the volume flow rate. They don't actually know how dense the gas is, and if the pressure goes up or the temperature changes, then the density will change and a different amount of um, gas will flow through the meter for a given flow rate. I eventually found a pair of true mass flow controllers on eBay for quite a bit less than what they usually sell for. Uh, surprisingly, even on eBay, these things typically go for a few hundred dollars each, and in this case I got these two for substantially less. The flow controller is an active device, and it consists of a sensor and some analog amplification circuitry and a valve to regulate the flow of gas going through the whole thing. So the set point is determined by uh, an external voltage and then that's fed into this analog circuitry. So we basically have a closed loop servo control system. So the way it actually measures gas flow is by applying a little bit of heat to this sensing tube here. And normally if no gas were flowing through this sensor tube, the thermal profile would look something like this. So the, the tube is hot here and it's not as hot at the ends because it's attached to the rest of the system. So there'd be this nice smooth Gaussian profile distribution. However, if there's gas flowing through this little sensing tube, the profile will look something more like this. It will be shifted over and it will be spread out. It'll be a little bit more lopsided. So basically we've got two wound coils around the sensing tube and if there's gas flowing through there, the further down part of the tube will be hotter. In other words, this coil will be hotter because the temperature profile has shifted over and we can sense that difference with the analog circuitry so we know that there's gas flowing through there. What's interesting is that uh, if the gas pressure changes, so let's say suddenly our input pressure doubles or something like that, then there's just more molecules in here to soak up the heat as they're traveling through the tube and uh, we will get a, a reading, like we can detect when the pressure changes. Similarly, if the input temperature changes, we don't really care too much because we're mostly just interested in the uh, shape of this profile. So even if the overall temperature goes up, it doesn't matter because really all we're making is a differential measurement here. One consideration is that we want the gas flowing through this small tube to be laminar flow so that turbulence doesn't cause our readings to be weird. So what we do is we put a restriction in the main flow path that has almost, uh, well has a known resistance so that when we split the flow into this little metered flow and the main flow, uh, that ratio holds constant for uh, the operating range of the valve. So here's a valve where I've taken the cover off. This is the cover here. This little chamber here presumably has the metering tube in it. And then here's the control valve. And then most of the gas goes straight through, uh, through that restriction in the bottom there. These valves need to be calibrated for the specific gas that you're going to be measuring. So it's no fair to calibrate it on oxygen and then switch to argon. Uh, it will not. It will still compensate for pressure differences, but the overall reading will be off because argon and oxygen have different thermal properties. Since what we're measuring here is the ability for the gas to carry heat from one heater to the next, uh, if the gas's thermal properties change, then that is going to change the reading. This unit is calibrated for 100 standard cubic centimeters per minute of argon, and this valve that I have hooked up is 10 cubic centimeters of oxygen per minute. In order to do a rough sort of sanity check calibration on these devices, I hooked this one up and set it to mid-scale, and I put the tube in a beaker of water so we can see how much gas is visually coming out. 
Uh, it's set to mid scale and the full range is 10 standard cubic centimeters a minute. So in theory, this is what five standard cubic centimeters of oxygen looks like. I also have a rotameter in line going into the flow controller just to get a reading, a, a, a comparison reading. And the numbers appear to be agreeing pretty well. The rotameter is coming up with about 3.6 or 3.7 standard cubic centimeters of air. However, the rotameter is calibrated for one atmosphere. And currently I have about 12 PSI or almost two atmospheres going into the flow meter. This actually makes sense since earlier I said that pressure will cause a pressure change will cause the rotameter to be incorrect and in this case a higher pressure means a lower volume flow so the rotameter will read low when the pressure is above its uh, intended calibration point and uh, as it turns out the difference or the the correction factor is the square root of the ratio of the pressure differences so in this case we've got uh, about square root two. Since we're running at about 12 PSI, that's almost two atmospheres absolute. Uh, and that's about 1.4, the square root of two. And so if we multiply 1.4 by the 3.6 or seven, we get up to about five. And that makes sense since I, I set the flow meter to or the flow controller to mid scale. Here's a closer look at the flow controller itself. Inside there, there's actually an LM324 quad op amp there and it's got a bunch of internal pots to set uh, presumably slope and uh, uh, gain internal gain stuff. There's only one pot exposed to the outside. There's a hole in the outside cover for calibration. So apparently once all these other ones are set, in fact this one even has a do not adjust sticker on it, then the meter is good for anything. And to adjust for different gas types and different uh, maximum flow rates, I think they just changed this one pot here and change a, uh, an aperture, like a, a pinhole or something inside to basically set the overall flow rate. Annoyingly, the meter requires plus and minus 15 volts to operate and then uh, accepts a zero to five volt input control signal to tell it how much flow you want. It has these two TO220 uh, transistors to control power going into the valve. And it also outputs a zero to five volt signal to tell you what it thinks the flow rate is. So you can actually uh, tune, the, or at least you can be aware if the thing is not servoing correctly. If your application requires rapid flow changes, you can uh, see how the actual flow rate is, not, is or is not meeting your requested flow rate. Okay, well I'm gonna get these installed on my vacuum chamber and hopefully be sputtering pretty soon. Okay, see you next time, bye.